Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that he came to live, die, and rise again, that he might save the lost. Father, we pray for this time, asking you to speak to us through your word. Father, in your word that you have said that because you are good and because you love us, you are eager to give your children good gifts. You are eager to give us your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we pray that this morning you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see what you have written to us, that we might see Christ and how amazing he is in this text. He is the King of glory. He is the Lord, strong and mighty. And Father, we pray that you help us to worship him in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So sometimes uh, certain details can make us reevaluate the way we see past events. Uh, you might think about a familiar event in your life or a familiar exciting time that you were really enthused about, and then a little detail or some detail comes up that makes you reinterpret what just happened. Uh, back in the 80s and the 90s, uh, it was an exciting time for the world of baseball. Uh, wild numbers of home runs, records were being broken left and right. Uh, a couple of my cousins were really into baseball growing up, and so uh, I remember kind of the tail end of this excitement. Uh, I remember hearing names like Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco, uh, the Bash brothers on the A's. Uh, by the time I was aware of Mark McGuire, I think he was on the Cardinals away. And it was a time of like great excitement. New enthusiasm for the sport was building. Baseball, you, you might have signed up your kids for baseball. Your kids might have asked to be signed up for baseball. You might have asked to sign up for baseball at that time. It was really exciting. And this new enthusiasm and all this hype was reaching new heights. And then in 2005, uh, Jose Canseco comes out with his tell-all book uh, entitled Juiced, a book detailing the usage of steroids in Major League Baseball. And things weren't quite the same after that. This one overlooked detail made everyone reevaluate their previous excitement. Uh, the revelation of steroid usage forced their, all baseball fans and all people to realize all their excitement about these home runs that Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco and all these guys were hitting wasn't all that it seemed. Maybe their enthusiasm wasn't as storybook as they thought it was. One detail, steroid usage, colored the way they viewed their previous excitement. In the same way, we're going to see that with our passage today. Um, part of our passage today is a familiar one. Um, if you notice from the songs, you could have guessed. It's the excitement of the triumphal entry, the triumphal entry. But the other part of our passage today, uh, Luke tells us that Jesus was in this moment of apparent triumph. He was weeping. Jesus was weeping in anguish, and this significant detail must recolor how we understand Luke's account of the triumphal entry. And so specifically today, what we're going to see from the passage is that the sovereign king calls us to make peace with him today. The sovereign king calls us to truly make peace with him today. And, uh, but before, before we get there, first, let's backpedal a little bit. Uh, we, we've been in the Gospel of Luke uh, in our English service, starting, and, and it's been a while now, but starting from the end of Luke chapter 9, which is around September, October of last year, uh, we've been in a stretch of Luke, 
known as, as Jesus' Jerusalem journey, his Jerusalem journey. And so let's take a small journey just back through the book of Luke about what we've covered. Luke is 24 chapters long. The first two chapters are dedicated to the origins of John the Baptist and Jesus himself. We know the famous verse, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Peanuts, right? Charlie Brown Christmas special. We, we know that verse. Chapters 3 and nine, three through 9 essentially could cover the majority of Jesus' ministry time-wise. He starts when he's 30, and we know from John that he goes to about when he's 33. He goes around preaching the good news of the kingdom to all these towns, and he gathers some disciples, uh, confirms this gospel of the kingdom through his healings and miracles. All his ministry essentially answers the question, who is this Jesus? Who is Jesus? And Jesus, we see, is the glorious Son of God who would bring the kingdom of God into the world. And so Luke 9 shows Jesus at his most glorious, perhaps, on earth. Shows the glory of his kingdom to God, of God to Peter, John, and James in private. Luke 9.29 says, And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing, his clothing became a dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking to him. Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Uh, and skipping ahead to 34, and as Peter, James, and John were there, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And so chapters 3 and 9, capping off the section about who is Jesus in his ministry, Jesus is the Son of God. He is the chosen one who is about to accomplish something amazing at Jerusalem. And now, at the end of chapter 9, Luke tells us when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so starting from the end of chapter 9 all the way to the end of chapter 19 is this journey where Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. And so Luke spends a majority of his 24-chapter book detailing the events of Jesus' final Jerusalem journey. He slows down the timetable. He covers three years and six chapters, but he slows down the timetable now for this last journey. And it's been a rough journey. Uh, opposition was growing toward Jesus but we also see the way of discipleship to the disciples that don't listen very well, the cost of following Jesus, his compassion to seek and save the lost, right? For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And last week, we, we read about the parable of the Minas, we, we ought to, how we ought to be like the servant who invested for his king and not like the wicked and lazy servants who didn't really have a relationship with him. This whole journey brings us to today's passage, and today we're going to be reading the culmination and climax of Luke's, Luke's chapters 9 to 19, this whole Jerusalem journey. This is the climax of this journey, and the journey of the chosen one who has been coming to Jerusalem to do the will of God now, now, now crescendos right here. And today we're going to be looking at our passage in two contrasting strokes, two contrasting strokes, two tonally different sections. Um, we're going to see first that Jesus approaches Jerusalem, and then we're going to see how he weeps over Jerusalem. First, how he approaches, and then how he weeps. And there, there's a deep contrast between this king being royally and loudly celebrated, approaching his royal city, all the while this king is weeping is in anguish. So we're going to first see how Jesus triumphantly approaches Jerusalem, and then second, how he weeps as he approaches. And so if you haven't yet, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Um, Luke chapter 19, verse 28. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one from the pew. And we're going to read Luke 19... 28 to 44. What we want to see from this passage is that the sovereign king calls us to make peace with him today. 
Let's read. This, this is God's word. God speaking to us, for us. Verse 28. And when he had said these things, uh, when Jesus said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he, drew new and saw, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's go ahead and pray one more time asking God to open his word for us. Father, what an amazing and weighty and sobering passage mixed with joy and great warning. Father, you are a God who brings judgment. Father, you are also a God who brings peace. And so, Father, we pray your Holy Spirit would reveal to us the things that make for peace, that you reveal to us the great glory of your Son as we read these words. We beg of you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's first look at Jesus approaching Jerusalem in verses 28 to 40. Jesus approaching Jerusalem in verses 28 to 40. And as a side note, while most of your Bibles probably have uh, the, the, the title maybe somewhere, the triumphal entry written somewhere here over this section, for, for Luke, for Luke, as far as Luke is concerned, this isn't technically an entry. <laughs> Jesus isn't technically into Jerusalem until verse 45. He's kind of approaching on the way, all the way this week. Um, and so maybe in, as far as Luke is concerned, this little section is better called the triumphal approach. Uh, he, he's still approaching the city all the way through 28 through 44 today. Um, and so for the entry, we'll have to wait till next week. Or maybe not, I don't know. Um, Now we start with this. Jesus is a city away from Jerusalem. Um, He's like a city over, and he describes in detail what he wants the disciples to do and then what's going to happen. Verse 29, he says, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. And, And then it all happens in verses 32 to 34. And Luke doesn't focus too much on the colt, so we won't focus too much on the colt too, too much today either. Uh, but we do know that riding on the colt or uh, the donkey would paint Jesus in a humble and meek light. It's uh, from the other gospel accounts. We know that it's a fulfillment of prophecy, but Luke doesn't spend too much time on it, so neither will we. Um, now, this section brings a few questions, though. Uh, how did Jesus know that no one had ever sat on the colt? Uh, <laughs> Why did Jesus have to describe the whole thing? And why did Luke record Jesus 
Jesus' whole future description of this kind of unexciting interchange? And then why did Luke record the unexciting interchange itself? It's just driving a cult, right? Um, why didn't Luke just write, uh, Jesus told a couple of disciples to get a never sat on cult from town, and then they did it, right? Well, why is there so much detail given to this? And the reason Luke details for us Jesus' prophetic prediction of these events surrounding even this unexciting little thing with the cult is to highlight Jesus' perfect knowledge and control. Even though Jesus approaches his own death in Jerusalem, he knows exactly how all events, even the unexciting ones involving cult fetching, he knows how all of these events are going to unfold. Nothing is out of control, even when everyone thinks he's captured and being crucified and everything spiraling out of control. Nothing is out of control. Jesus knows all as in, and is in control of all, and he is truly worthy of the praise he's about to receive. Even as he approaches his own death, he knows everything. He's sovereignly in control of even the smallest details. He knows what is going to happen, and that is the same today. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen in our lives when everything feels like it's out of control or out of our reach or we need to grab the reins and take responsibility, Jesus is in utter control. And so moving on to the passage uh, from this preparation of getting the cult, we move to the approach itself, verses 35 to 40. Uh, 35, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the cult, they set, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And so what they're doing with the cloaks was uh, something they would do for royalty. Uh, in 2 Kings 9, we see that done for the king. This is something that represents uh, royalty. People didn't own a ton of cloaks back then. They had one, maybe two. And so this was something precious given down to show how valuable this person was. Uh, reading more in verse 37. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, still approaching, right? The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. They're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And so, um, as we figure this out, we'll keep going in the text. But so these are the disciples. Uh, you can't. If you have an electronic Bible, you can still see it. If you don't, I'm sorry. Um, but you, if you look down and look at your glowing screens, these are the disciples, not a random crowd. As far as Luke is concerned, it's not this random crowd. Uh, the crowd certainly eventually joins the disciples. So we're back. Awesome. The crowd joins the disciples later, right? Um, we see the word, the crowd, the Pharisees kind of sneak out in verse 39. But the disciples are the instigators of all this praising. So the disciples are leading the pack, they're, they're instigating everything, and moreover, they're praising in loud, loud voices, which is strange, weird. Uh, Jesus spent the majority of his ministry trying not to announce his presence, and especially not to announce his divine or royal identity. So why now? Why, why does Jesus now openly so loudly announce who he is, or let them announce who he is? And I, I think Jesus does this for maybe two reasons. For two reasons. First, uh, a time of reckoning and visitation for the Jews is here. Uh, there's a call for Jerusalem to wholly accept and wholly embrace Jesus as their king. And in the grace of God, Jesus wants the, this call to be announced loud and clear. He wants it to be announced loud and clear. And in the grace of God, Jesus wants this call to be accepted, but we know they won't accept it. A uh, second reason Jesus draws attention to himself now is because the time of sacrifice, the time of sacrifice on the cross is near, and he needs to draw attention to it. 
Bishop uh, J.C. Ryle from the previous couple centuries ago, he says, his work as a sacrifice for sin and substitute for sinners remained to be accomplished. Before giving himself up as a sacrifice, he desired to draw the attention of the whole Jewish nation to himself. The Lamb of God was about to be slain, the great sin offering was about to be killed, and it was fit that the eyes of all Israel should be fixed upon him. This great work of redemption was not to be done in a corner. And, and, and so we see he does it publicly so that the work of redemption might be known when he rises again, when he dies. Now there's a key phrase in verse 37 uh, saying how the disciples were rejoicing for all the mighty works or uh, all the miracles, uh, literally concerning all the power Jesus had displayed. This little phrase in verse 37 lets us know the motivation for, for the disciples' praise. Jesus' is power. And this, this is technically not a bad thing. On the one hand, it is good to praise him for his power, and because of his power, to praise him as the chosen king. He raised the dead, he, he showed great wisdom, he prophesied greatly, he healed all manner of sickness. What power and what authority. And so it is not unreasonable to think, yes, yeah, surely, this Jesus, this, this amazing Jesus will be the one who finally comes to Jerusalem that takes place as king, to free all the Jews, to free us from Roman oppression, to bring a brand new Jewish kingdom on earth. On the other hand, this is not what Jesus came to do. Uh, these miracles, this display of power, was meant to confirm the message Jesus brought. It was good to the disciples, yes, to praise Jesus for his miracles, yet they weren't praising him for quite the right reason, the most ultimate reason. Jesus did not come to earth during that time to be a conquering king. Uh, Jesus didn't even really come technically primarily to do miracles and mighty works. Luke 4 says, Luke 4.43 says, I must, preach good new, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose, right? The, the purpose of preaching the good news. Um, and so all the while, on the one hand, it's good to pray, show praise to Jesus for his power. On the other hand, it, all this praise was concerning just the power and not the good news that he brought, the good news of peace with God through his life, death, and resurrection. The crowd's excitement is misplaced, so close, but so far it's this tragic twist of irony. Um, right to praise, wrong reason. Jesus was not to be praised for his power as a political, potential, miracle-working, and conquering king. They should have praised him for the good news he brought with peace with God. The good news that says any sinner that would repent and trust in him will be made right with God. Maybe that's you today, praising Jesus for the wrong reasons. Maybe for the wrong reasons ultimately. Maybe they're good reasons, but you've made a good reason your ultimate reason. Maybe you praise him and you love him because he gives you a sense of purpose. Maybe because he makes you feel less guilty. Maybe because he tells your kid, this is right. he gives you power to tell your kids this is right and this is wrong. He gives you moral high ground. Maybe because he gives you a community. Maybe because he gives you friends. And none of these things are bad, just like praising Jesus for mighty works aren't bad. But when these reasons become the ultimate reason we enjoy the Lord, it is sin. Our joy in the Lord must ultimately come from the person of Jesus himself and how amazing he is. We must love the giver over all of his gifts. We must love the giver over his gifts, even the gifts of purpose, morality, community, or, or forgiveness itself. We must ultimately love and praise Jesus for who he is, not just who we want him to be. Uh, let's keep reading now. Uh, we, we see, we're going to keep reading now, and this is the last appearance of the Pharisees explicitly in Luke. Um, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. 
he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And then, so first the phrase again, in the crowd, lets us know that a great crowd is now formed. Uh, a crowd formed disciples and non-disciples alike because there, there are Pharisees in it. The Pharisees can't hope to control the crowd or the disciples who are the instigators. And so they try to appeal to Jesus himself, right? It's like a loud room. When, I, when there's a loud room and I can't control the room, I'll go to like the tallest person in the room and see if they can do it. But, so that's what they're trying to do. Jesus is on, he's, he's on the cult. They're going to him. He's the leader and he's kind of, I guess, highest up. But Jesus shuts them down. And he highlights the utter necessity that he needs to be praised loudly at this time. Right? Even if they were silent, the stones would cry out. And moreover, in rebuking the Pharisees, Jesus shows that he approves of this praise. He approves of the praise that the disciples give him. He is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. And while the disciples' perception of Jesus might not be completely on point, their praise, the actual words themselves, right on. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The work of redemption draws near and the time of visitations for the, Jews, for the Jews is here. And so the identity of Jesus must be put on center stage that he is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. What an entrance, right? Jesus knows everything. He's sovereign over everything. He's the king of everything. He's the king that comes in the name of the Lord. He's the prophesied Messiah that's going to make everything right. And if the disciples were silent, the stones would cry out. This is, this is, this is majestic and triumphant stuff. Yet, uh, we, we know how history unfolds from here. In just a few days, when Jesus is being crucified these disciples would be silent. And the crowds that amass these random people that amass around Jesus on Friday, joining in in this praise, will be saying something very different on Friday. Crucify him. And this brings us to our second section. Uh, first, we saw that as Jesus approached Jerusalem, that he's the coming king that's going to bring glory to God and peace with God. Secondly, now, we move to Jesus' weeping, verses 41 to 44. Having now seen the full truth of Jesus' kingship, we now see this king begin to weep in anguish over Jerusalem. And verses 41 to 44 help us to realize that while everything seemed great in the, in the triumphal entry or triumphal approach, not all is as it seems. Verses 41 through 44 must recolor and temper how we understand 28 to 40. As the, this picture that Luke paints is that as the disciples proclaim Jesus as a king in triumph approaching his royal city, Jesus the king weeps for it. And he weeps for two uh, related reasons. He weeps first because of the present blindness of Jerusalem. And he also weeps for the future judgment that will come upon Jerusalem. He weeps for the present blindness and he weeps for the future judgment. And so first we read in verses 41 and 42 about Jesus weeping for their current blindness, the blindness of the people. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And so first we see in the mere facts of Jesus weeping, this great compassion, here and at the tomb of Lazarus and John are, the, I think, the only two places where we have Jesus weeping. This great compassion. He does not delight in their blindness. He does not delight in their judgment. He wishes that they would turn, oh, that they would turn to him. Jesus weeps because he wishes they would have known this day the things that made for peace. But instead of knowing the things that made for peace, the way of peace was hidden from their eyes. Uh, Jesus' presence on earth, especially his coming to Jerusalem, was this day, this day of visitation. 
It was the day of reckoning for the Jews. Uh, They ought to have embraced Jesus wholly as their king, but they didn't. No, Jerusalem would instead crucify this man. The Jews were like the citizens of the parable we read last week. Uh, Luke 19, 14 from the parable last week says, But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Yes, Jesus has affected the lives of much in the crowd. Yes, Jesus has a great following of disciples and other people, but ultimately they're going to fall away. Those in the crowds that cheer him on this day are going to be yelling to crucify him a few days later. The, the, the language in verse 42 of hidden is also significant. Um, these things are hidden from their eyes now. It's the language of blindness. Uh, what hidden refers to is the fact that, really, that all mankind is blind. That all people are blind. There is a God, there is a God who rules the universe. He is perfect and holy. And this great God who created all the universe, he created the universe and he created everyone and everything to enjoy his glory and to give him glory. To enjoy his glory and to give him glory. He's a good and holy God who gives perfect justice and always punishes evil. God and good have nothing to do with evil. But the Bible tells us that man is evil. The Bible tells us that we hate God and we are blind to see God in all his amazing beauty. His glory is hidden from our eyes, but, but the way it's hidden is not in a way that we're victims. No, we are not victims in our blindness. We are blind to the light of God because we love our own darkness. John three nineteen says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Mankind has the things that make for peace hidden from their eyes, not because we're helpless victims, but because we love our darkness and all that is evil and wicked so much. And so we deserve the punishment of the good and perfect God. Lovers of evil will be punished by the good and holy God in hell forever and ever because good must punish evil. But there's good news. Our title for the series of the book of Luke is Good News of Great Joy. And as this passage said, there there are things that make for peace. There are things that make for peace that can be known. And today we know clearly that peace comes through the gospel. Uh, The word gospel is a word that means good news. It's a word that means good news. And so the gospel of peace says that Jesus Christ has come into the world to live and die and rise again for sinners. So that we can have peace with God. So that we don't have to face the fury of his wrath and hell forever. Jesus comes and lives the perfect life that we owe to God. And when he dies, our sin is counted onto him. And he takes the full wrath of God. He's going to take the full wrath of God on the cross. He drinks it down to the dregs. Every ounce of torment, of eternal torment in hell, he suffers on the cross for his people. And as he rises again, he rises again so anyone that trusts him can have new life We'd be born again. We'd be made into new people, free from sin, free from all of our addictions and old ways, and inside the infinite joy of God. How can we get this? How can we be saved? Not by anything we could ever do or earn, but as a gift. Call it grace. It must be the Holy Spirit that comes and makes us born again makes us a new creation, and gives us a new heart to trust him. The Holy Spirit must open our blind eyes so that we can have faith in him. It's not a matter of just coldly deciding to follow him like you're trying to decide on what wallpaper you want for your house. It's, it's not just that kind of deciding where to eat. We must throw ourselves upon Jesus. We must throw ourselves upon him and plead with him and look to him to be the king and savior of our lives. We must throw ourselves upon the mercy of the king, knowing that 
He's quick to give mercy. We must throw ourselves upon the mercy of the king, begging for peace as if we had no other hope because we have no other hope. We really do have no other hope. And if we trust him, and if we have faith in him, we have the things that make for peace. We have peace with God. Our sins are no more forever gone. Our faith in Christ means our sins are taken care of. And when God looks at us, all he sees is Christ's perfect life. The records are switched. God punishes Jesus, and he sees us, and he only counts Jesus' perfection. We can have peace with God as we are transformed by the Holy Spirit to see and become more like his son, walking with him, falling more in love with him. And we can have peace with God, wonder of wonders, to be with him, to be with him be with this holy God forever. The things of the gospel are the things that make for peace. The gospel is what can bring us peace. Continuing onward in the text, we see that on top of Jesus weeping for the present blindness of the Jews, for the present blindness, he also weeps for the impending future judgment. Verse 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you to the ground, and you and your children. And they will not leave one stone upon you because you do not know the time of your visitation. And there's a prophetic tone in this. Historically, most interpreters agree that verses 43 and 44 were fulfilled with the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Around, in about 40 years from when Jesus is saying this, the Romans would come to Jerusalem, because right now uh, the Jews are under Roman rule, they would eventually agitate the Romans. The Romans would come to Jerusalem, build barricades and walls around the city so they could siege it, and then they would sack the city. And Jesus weeps knowing that this will happen to the Jews. But what was the reason for this judgment? The passage tells us because you did not know the time of your visitation. Because they didn't know what made for peace at the time of God's reckoning, judgment comes. They ought to have thrown themselves before the feet of the king who was riding on a colt, pleading with him for mercy. They would have made, that would have made for peace. They would have received this peace and God in his joy, but instead they ignored him, they rejected him, they reinterpreted him however they wanted. And they killed him. Judgment came upon Jerusalem because they rejected Jesus. God brings judgment to those who reject his king. And the same is still true today. We must know this. God will not simply allow us to reject his king with no consequences. There will be judgment, and the judgment that comes after death is an eternal judgment. Uh, even if you call yourself a Christian today, examine your life to see if you are living like a Christian. If you say you're a Christian, but you're not living like one, then, then repent today. Jesus must be both Savior and King in our lives. Is Jesus King? Is he King over everything? To live like Jesus isn't your king is to effectively prove that he isn't and that you reject him. Repent and make peace with God. The Lord will not allow you to reject his king either in word or in your lifestyle without judgment. The Lord offers peace still today. Our day of visitation, the day of God's reckoning, is not yet upon us. It is not too late. Jesus Christ is sovereign. He knows everything. He is in control of everything, even the smallest detail of your lives. Jesus Christ is king. He is the king and savior who brings peace between God and man and all creation owes him total allegiance. And peace with God is the best thing we could have. It's worth giving up everything to have. The greatest joy you can ever experience is 
pales in comparison to the joy of Jesus. And today he still offers this peace. Make peace with God today before the time of judgment. Throw yourself upon the mercy of the king. The sovereign king calls us to make peace with him today. Let's pray. Father, that we might know in our hearts and believe with all of our might the things that make for peace. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray that those here that do not know you, those here that have only pretended to know you, or even those that know you that have been avoiding you, that today you would, by your Holy Spirit, prompt us to make peace with you. God, cause our hearts to throw ourselves upon your mercy, the mercy of the Son, the mercy of the King who is controlling everything, who is in control of every part of our lives. Help us to see how amazing he is to trust him, to trust him with everything and to give up everything to follow him, knowing that we will get more than everything back because Christ is valuable. Father, we pray that your word would take root in our hearts, that we would not be like the Jews at the time of Jesus, that you would not leave us in our blindness, that you would open our eyes to 